Well, good morning, Family Church. Let's get on our feet. Let's get ready to worship the Lord. He's good. He's faithful. Jesus, that 
wash is white as snow. I believe that the power of a gospel still makes the broken whole. I believe that the curse of sin was broken when they rolled away that stone. I believe, I believe, I believe. As I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. And no matter where I go, no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. I believe that the walls will start falling when we fall down on church begins to sing. Look at what the Lord has done. Sing it to the darkness that the light has come. Sing it to the nations. Look at what the Lord has done. Sing it to the daughters. Sing it to the sons. To every generation. Look at what the Lord has done. Sing it to the darkness that the light has come. Sing it to the nations. Look at what the Lord has done. Come on and look at what the Lord has done. And as I bow. a wretch. I remember who I was. 
I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. And sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time I had hope. For the blood applied, thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. my place laid inside my tomb of sin you were buried for three days but then you walked right out again and now death has no steam and life has no in the 
There we go. Battery went out. Um, aren't you glad your batteries don't go out in Jesus' name? So we're going to recharge our batteries and draw up to the, the communion table. And uh, on the 1 Corinthians chapter 11, first of all, how, how you doing? It's good to see you all. God bless you. Look over at somebody and smile. Say good morning. While it's still morning, Paul the Apostle, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So to prevent that, it says, but a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So one of the verses that I think stands out about examining self-examination is, don't you realize this about yourself? Test yourself to see if you're in the faith. He says, don't you realize this about yourself, that Jesus is in you and you don't fail the test? How many of you have asked Jesus to come into your heart? Well, so he's at work in you. Um, but we don't want him to be occupying our heart with any bitterness or any unforgiveness or any like circle thinking about stuff that we ought not. So let's close our eyes just for a moment. Lord, I right now open my heart to you and let your light shine in my life. I'm grateful for your conviction and your correction. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. You're my father. And so that's part of the love you show me is keeping me in check and on track. And as I receive communion today, it's more about receiving all your provision even than it is the self-examination, but today we just push aside any sin, 
any darkness, any unforgiveness, any lesser thing out of our lives through repentance, Lord. And according to 1 John 1, 9, as we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And for that, we are so grateful. Just take a moment. David even said, please forgive me my presumptuous sins. The Catholics talk about the sin of omission or commission, what you did or what you should have done that you didn't do. And uh, so we just thank you that the blood of Jesus covers all of it. And that, Lord, there's a new, new beginning today, a possibility of a new, brand new beginning. And um, we receive communion and acknowledge all your provision. And according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So it's at our disposal. It's available to us. It's part of the provision. Say this with me. And my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So God, I pray for bodies to be healed. I pray for minds to be renewed. I pray for relationships to be mended. I pray for finances to coffers to fill back up. I pray for your abundance and your provision. I pray, God, that since we're not alone, I pray for a special uh, stirring in our spiritual lives. I pray we have a personal revival today in Jesus' name. Amen. So take the bread and just receive Jesus as your healer. Thank you for healing my body, Lord. And thank you that the blood applied to our lives means the cancellation out of, of our debt to sin, a debt of sin. Hallelujah. Amen. New beginnings, seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. So good. Well, good morning, everybody. So happy to see you in the third service. I want to welcome all of you. I would like you to turn around and say hi to people you know and people you don't know. Just turn around, spend a moment greeting each other, walking around, saying howdy. So good, and we want when we take communion, we don't want to do it like Pastor Jeff read for, in an unworthy manner. And believing something other than God meeting all of your needs according to His riches and glory is that unworthy manner. So when you receive communion, know that God meets all of your needs. So we don't want to we don't want to leave anything anything of doubt that our needs might not be met. And so when we go into to God's presence, and we take that, we don't want to think, oh, maybe it doesn't, maybe Jesus' blood doesn't qualify me for this, but it does when we take, we take that, so it's so good, I love taking communion, and I love being part of this church, I love being here with, with everyone, we have a lot going on, next Friday, during the day, we have a play date for the moms and the kids, and those have been a hit with the kids and with the moms. Um, those are every other Friday from 10 to 12, just a way for the kids to burn some energy. And last, last play date, Rob and CISO made a sand pit for the kids, and he made, the, like, he made Disney World for them. So they, they were very thankful for that. Um, and then next Sunday, we have Between the Buildings, so show up a little bit early next week, linger a little bit later, and have some fun. We'll have a petting zoo. We're going to have coffee and snacks and all good stuff. So show up a little early and just have fun, you know. It's good to, 
good to be together and good to meet some people from the other services. So for me, it's a little bit harder to get my routine worked backwards, but you can do it. It's good. Show up a little bit earlier. It's so much fun. And then the following week, we're going to have a huge weekend. It's going to be so much fun. We'll start off Friday night with a party on the patio. And then on that Sunday, you know what it is? It's Chelsea and Brian's wedding. And that is a big deal. It's uh, going to be a fun, fun day. So you don't want to miss that, uh, that whole weekend, but especially that wedding. It's at 3. We're going to have, uh, following the wedding, we're going to have coffee and cake in a big old snack table. So it'll be fun. You're going to get, well, uh, there's a lot of, lot of people uh, coming in town for that. So uh, a lot of us are going to be in our, like, nice clothes but we're still going to have to set up for it. So maybe if you want to volunteer, if you're looking for a spot to, to get in there, um, we could use help setting up and tearing down because, you know, we'll be in our, like, suits and stuff, and we're carrying tables in the heat. We'll get all, it'll look crazy for the pictures. So maybe if you want to help out, that'd be awesome on that day. Um, you can call the, uh, call the church or sign up in the lobby. Um, also, we, had, we have an ongoing opportunity to support families in this church by serving in Children's Church. And so we have some uh, kindergartners that are particularly rambunctious that we need to wrangle in. So we need some just energy. And it looks like we got a lot of energy here, right? So reserved energy, ready to implement it in Children's Church. So uh, that's, that's a great spot to be, you know. When you, when you give out to those kids, it puts it back into you. So you want to be a part of that. And now is an opportunity to give. God loves a cheerful giver. And I love being a part of this church. And when, you know, when we give, we're not just, uh, you know, uh, giving and just blindly, you know, giving or thinking that we can do a transaction with God. We're like, God, if I invest this much, then I'll get this much of a return. No, we give up with a cheerful heart, but knowing that, yeah, you do, you do reap when you give. You do, uh, God does provide for all of your needs. Um, he gives liberally. He doesn't just, he doesn't just hold back. Um, and when you give to this church, you know, you're, you're a part of the things that, um, that we do. You know, we've been, uh, yeah, it's good. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to ramble too much. But but there's a there's a whole lot that that you're you know that you're that you're given to and um, yeah we want to honor God and help people when we give and we get to be a part of that and I'm just so thankful for that. So God, I thank you for everything good that you're doing here. God, I thank you. You meet everybody's needs here according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I thank you, God, that we get to be a part of this church and what you're doing when we give. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Well, God is so faithful. I said, God is so faithful. Yes, he is. Isn't that right? Yes. Are you rested? You got you interested in some word? I've got a good word for you. Now, I've been on a series about restoration, but I want to tell you that the God we serve, he makes all things new. He makes all things new. And, um, uh, I want to go to Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. It's one of my favorite verses I use in evangelism when I share the gospel with individuals. Uh, it's the promise of a new birth, of a new beginning. Remember, he warned Adam. He said, if you eat this fruit, in dying you shall surely die. So spiritual death came into the world. And in Ephesians, the second chapter, in verse 1, it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works on the sons of disobedience. There's darkness that comes as a consequence of sin and death through sin. And the wages of sin is death. And so, you know, so as not to just hover on that and be morbid, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, 1 John 3, 8, and to seek and save that which is lost and to set captives free. And Ezekiel prophesies about Jesus, and the New American Standard says it this way, then I'll read the New Living Translation. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. Everybody say a new heart. And a new spirit. Everybody say a new spirit. That's that whole born again thing that Jesus talked about in John 3 to Nicodemus. Within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now, that's always been a little bit, I, I get it that it's a new spirit and a new heart, but, you know, a heart of flesh, I like the way the New Living Translation lays that out a little bit better. It's easier to understand in our modern thinking. He says, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you, very similar. But then he says, I will take out your stony, stubborn heart. Oh, yeah. Don't say amen on that part. And give you a tender, responsive heart. So it's before and after. Before, you know, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. In fact, let's go over to Ephesians, the second chapter, and just look at this for a minute and ponder a couple of things because it shows an amazing contrast between the before and after. I started reading this to you, but in Ephesians, it says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. In chapter 2, verse 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. or you, This was your lifestyle. This was habitual. According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. If you want to understand the times, look no further than that verse. That clarifies everything. There's a course. There's a spirit. There's an attitude. And um, we all lived in it. We were dead and lost before Jesus, I was 
lost in my transgressions. And in fact, verse 11, if you go down to verse 11, it says so much here. You should read the whole chapter. It's so rich. Saved by grace through faith. Not not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. It says, therefore, remember that you formerly, that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. So the non-Jews were were called Gentiles. And he said, uh, he said, you're, you were called, you're called the uncircumcision by the circumcision, which is actually performed in the flesh by human hands. Then it says in verse 12, remember that you were, now this is, this is before, this is B.C., we're going to look at A.D. in a minute, after Jesus, but it says you were, uh, at that time, look at this, separate from Christ, separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant, covenants of promise. So separated excluded strangers, not things you want to really live in. You know, we, we, as humans, we don't like rejection. I think that's one of the things that we, we dread the most. You know, we, we don't like to be excluded and left out, you know. And, uh, but we, by nature, we were sinful and lost, and we were, in and, and, and past tense, dead in our sins. And, it, and, and this in particular having no hope and without God in the world. I just think that's something we should remember. And in order to be forever grateful, in order to also be aware of um, where we've come from, you know, we're going to gain understanding of where we're going by remembering and, and seeing and recognizing where we've come from. And, um, and then it says, and then the next verse, then it goes into the before and after. He goes, but now. Everybody say, but now. He says, you were, but now. And the hinge point is receiving Jesus. In Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near. Now, which would you rather be, far off or brought near? <laughs> I mean, you know, nearness, my God, to thee. Uh, wasn't that the song they played in on the the band played on the Titanic as it was sinking? Nearer, my God, to thee. And uh, Irish uh, musician Van Morrison covered the famous hymn, "Just a Closer Walk with Thee." Grant it, Jesus, if you please. The psalmist said, "The nearness of God is my good," and I think the best part of Christianity is Jesus. And being close to Jesus. The best part of church is the head of the church, Jesus, and walking with Jesus. And it's sensible to do so. And if you think about what the former life was like, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were alienated and separated, excluded, far off. You know, when we were kids, we used to say, fire out, man, you know. But uh, then I realized I was not only far out, I was far off. Not a good thing. Far off, man. And early in the church days of my youth, um, people would share things and we'd say, that's off, bro. And it was just a thing. You know, you, when you're, you just don't want things to be off. But Jesus came to bring humanity that was off back on with him. He, he said, I will put a new spirit in you all. I'll put a new heart in you, and it'll be, I'll take away your stony, stubborn heart, and I'll give you a tender, receptive heart. And this, to me, is another significant feature of the calling to be a believer who, uh, in a God who brings restoration. You know, he said, I, even I, am the one who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will remember your sins no more. Who is glad for that? How blessed is the man, woman, or child whose sins are forgiven and, and whose iniquities God does not impute upon them. So we have a lot to be thankful for. And we were separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's before. But now, everybody say, but now. But now, um, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off, have brought, 
been brought near by the blood of Christ. I am so grateful that people told me I could have a relationship with God through Jesus. And that what was modeled to me at my early Christian beginnings was this accessible relationship with God. And that was what was so intriguing to me because the God thing was so difficult for me to grasp um, that I, I thought, well, it's some performance thing that you have to be so, so religious and read so much and pray so much and, and be, be holy and perfect. And, and um, the prerequisite for being saved is being a sinner and all have sinned. So he desires no one to perish but all to come to eternal life. So I'm sharing this with you for a couple of reasons. Just to stir up your sincere minds by way of reminder to, to put a song in your heart of gratitude that you who are separated and far off have been brought near. And the best part of knowing God, according to James or John chapter 17, verse 3, eternal life is knowing him, not knowing about him. It's good to know about him. It's good to know, develop knowledge, but it's good to... Like, I, I know a lot about my wife. I've been married for 45 years now. Um, but my favorite part of it is just knowing her. She's my best friend, and it's just knowing her. And that's the, the proximity, the, the joy of the companionship. And, and, and with God. And, and in church. I, I love church. Um, not for its formalism, but for its fellowship. You know, and... And, and I just, I thought about Ezekiel 36, and I, I, it reminded me in the New Testament where he says, I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. And my, my favorite, I think my favorite verse that's unlocked the mysteries of this to me is 2 Corinthians 5.17, where Paul, in his revelation about being in Christ, he said, he said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Look at that. Notice the word behold. When Jesus came on the scene, it didn't say glance at the lamb. It said behold the lamb. Uh, behold is make it your fixation. Make it your preponderance. Make it your central focus. Make it your priority. And, and uh, th this is, I hope, what's happening to you. There's a reset being pushed just in these moments in church today. That whatever you've been going through, I mean, this man's dad just came through surgery. This woman's dad is, is in a, a developing and fighting and in, in, a, in a physical battle, you know. And, and then as such, then it, it bears down on you, you know. People are going through different things. I talked to someone, they, they, they just got let go at their job, you know, and there's just some real issues there, you know. I just talked to a lady that's, uh, she said, I've come through the, the, the hard part of chemo, now I've got, I think she said she had eight or nine more IV treatments, you know, and she, she just, she's fighting the good fight of faith, you know, and, and, and what I love about the gathering is that we could stand together, we could support each other, we could weep with those who weep, we could rejoice with those who rejoice. We've heard so many great testimonies. Uh, we had a core meeting and Pastor Patsy called up uh, our son-in-law, Steve Kowalik, and David Moore, John and Jenna's son, and in an impromptu uh, little part of the session, uh, they, they did a role playing of, of uh, how to lead someone to the Lord and how to share the gospel do an, uh, with evangelism. So uh, Steve played the part of the center, and he, he, he took a big drag off of his invisible cigarette, flicked it out at us. I thought he was really in, he was good at being a sinner. So then, and then David led him to the Lord, and then David... And when he prayed for him, he started praying for the missionaries in Uganda, and he started praying for the food and all that. It was funny. It was, it was church stuff. But what ended up happening was these two young men and uh, some others in the church took a 30-day challenge inspired from that moment, and they've been out witnessing every day for 30 days uh, sharing the gospel with individuals. And they've had so many amazing moments like... Uh, they, they walked up to three, not one, not two, but three different people in the last two weeks that, were, that admitted they were dealing with suicidal thoughts. So they were out there on the brink of struggle 
And God sent these guys to just in an elegant, non-threatening, uh, not awkward way, just communicating the gospel. Uh, the other day, they went to a park, and they walked and walked and walked on the trails, and nobody was there. And they thought, well, we tried. We tried to find somebody. Nobody was there. So Steve went to throw away his water bottle, and there was another guy that came up to throw away his water bottle at the same time. So Steve, you know, th this is my opportunity. So he said, hey, it's, you know, it's hot, you know, like some, some small talk, I suppose. And then he said, hey, you know, Jesus loves you. And he goes, interesting you say that. I'm on a journey. He said, just two weeks ago, I went and bought an EVS Bible. Now, Steve and I know that it's not an EVS, it's an ESV. Um, and so Steve didn't go, well, actually, it's an ESV. You know, he didn't do that because that would be religious or weird, right? It's like, I'm here to correct that. You know, that he, he just let, let it be an EVS. ESV, EVS, I'm just glad you bought a Bible, right? Yeah. Hallelujah. We don't need to be legalistic weirdos, but... And he, he just was so receptive, and he, he just was baffled that all of a sudden he's having, he says, it's so amazing, I'm having this conversation. Well, think about how Steve felt. It looked like there wasn't an opportunity, and then there's an opportunity. And um, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were alienated and separated. We had no hope. The world is so broken. And uh, in order for us to really proceed in this hour, I think it's really important that we understand God to be the restorer, God to be the one that brings new birth and new life. How many of you remember before you were saved? How many of you are grateful now that you are saved? Who, who could see a contrast? Yet in our Christian lives, how much bombardment have you had since you've become a Christian? It's formidable. Um, but yet, we have to get back to these essentials in order for us to continue in our responsibility to communicate the gospel. I was just sitting next to, uh, we share grandfather duties, uh, David Ortnow, and I remember when he was a teenager, he became a Christian, and he, the light went on in his life, and he, and by the way, was real mature from the beginning. He just had a sensible way of sharing the gospel. He was he was, he, was, he was zealous, but not overly so. Um, you know, he, he was thoughtful, but he was relying on the Holy Spirit. His dad came to the Lord, became a great member of our church. And, uh, and God, it's spreading through his family. And now his wife, kids, and now grandchild, and it just continues. And uh, you stick around long enough, you're going to see some outstanding things. You're going to see some amazing things. I remember Chris Lazareshi when she was young. And then she met Jeff, and, and uh, Jeff was from a denomination, a, a real uh, conservative uh, mainline denomination, but yet, you know, brought up in, in the Judeo-Christian reality. And, uh, you know, he, God really touched he, he and his wife, and then they birthed a couple of kids. And the kids are fantastic. And it's just spreading. The gospel's contagious. The good news is that I will take away the stony heart, the stubborn heart, and I'll give you a tender, receptive heart. And, you know, I, I work out, and I, I realized I was getting calluses on my hands from picking up. You know, when you're picking up 500 pounds, 600 pounds with one hand, it'll give you a callus, right? So uh, <laughs> some exaggeration was involved there. But, uh, but, I but I take the rings off and put them in my little, um, uh, little fifth pocket on my jeans, yeah, I work out in my jeans. But anyway, um, it's, it's, you know, because that, that wearing can create callus. Can I tell you the weighty, heavy stuff that we handle in life? It's designed to get us just sort of worn down and sort of calloused. Aren't you glad God could take away the stoniness out of our lives, the stubbornness out of our lives, and continue to tenderize us? In fact, every time I come to church here, what my goal, one of my goals of many, is, one of them is to help all of us to stay tender toward the Lord and yielded to the Lord. And that by the time we leave the meeting today, we will have re-upped on that and, uh, you know, sort of got rid of the calluses and the hardness that life tries to produce and uh, just stay tender before God. Now, Jana Moore gave me a scripture a while back that God will harden me to difficulties. I think it's out of Jeremiah somewhere. 
Isaiah. And uh, I thought, oh, thanks for that scripture, Jana. And I walked away, and as I walked away, I realized, oh, God was preparing me to have to deal with some stuff. And I tell you, after that verse was given to me, I did go through, we did go through a series of pretty serious battles that would have, the devil would have designed it to make us question whether God loved us and you get hardened and get hurt and become victims. None of which happened, thankfully, because God was always there and the Holy Spirit was always washing and renewing and helping us and replenishing us where we got dry. And in fact, it says in Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, it says, do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? He said, I will even make a roadway in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. He makes a way where there is no way. He brings answers before we can even put to the, the questions together. He brings help to us and hope to us even when we don't know we need it. He's a very present help in the time of need. Very present help in trouble. And uh, Declan, you're getting married in uh, uh, October or September? October. And uh, I'm telling you, the Lord is there for you at the inception I've been married a little while, and he's there with you through the processes. He's with you like David said. He said, I was young, and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or God's seed beg for bread. So when I was talking to the lady who had a career in the uh, uh, rehab, drug rehab world and was a real, real hard worker, real loving, caring, you know, um, tough love, but really caring thoughtful, uh, compassionate person. And then she gets hit with a cancer battle. You know what she does? She, she doesn't go, why God, why? She runs to God. And not like foxhole salvation or foxhole repentance. It's like, I'm all in. I, I realize I need God. Do you realize you need God? We have realized that. I'm preaching to the choir with that. A lot of people don't realize that. But these guys that have made that 30-day uh, commitment They've run into not one, not two, but three people who are so desperate that they're, they've, they've entertained thoughts of suicide. The, the one guy that bought the EVS Bible that's just randomly at the same trash can at the same time in a random walk out in obscure woods running into a stranger, that's what God is doing in this hour uh, with people like us during times like this. And so... We, we go to the scriptures and we see this is hardcore biblical. Uh, I will give a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. And I will take away the stony, stubborn heart. And I'll give you a tender, responsive heart. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a brand new creature, a brand new creation. One translation says a brand new species of being that has never before existed. The old things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. He says, behold, I will do something new. Behold is to stop and ponder it. Pay attention to it. You guys online, just for a moment, pay attention to this. Jesus is doing something. He said, I will build my church. And he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God's doing something. He's at work in you. Philippians 2.13 says, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So you get, start getting cynical, that's the callous thing I'm talking about. You start getting analytical, you start drifting. It's the spirit of the age trying to vie for your thought life and get you, pull you just gradually, gradually off course so you're less effective as a light of the world, less impactful as the salt of the earth. For what good is salt if it loses its savor? And uh, I just ate a hard-boiled egg without any salt, and it was pretty bland, and it says that in the book of Job. You would think I'd have had a salt shaker. Where's the salt shaker? St. Louis Family Church, among many, we're a salt shaker. And we got to, but, but the, the salt in your heart wasn't put there to stay. stay. Salt isn't salt till you give it away. I just made that up. And uh, this is the salt shaker, and this is the bland, weird, crazy world where people are, get the stuck in a moment 
lost, dead in their trespasses and sins, separated, excluded, strangers, no hope without God in the world. One of the things these guys have reported to me is we've noticed, you know, people are, people are considering Jesus for themselves. Some people, to be sure, a couple of them have just said, talk to the hand, d- dismissive. Uh, but at least they heard the gospel. But it's fascinating. They've led a number of people to the Lord. They led a guy named Juan to the Lord. Juan looked up at him. He said, man, what was that? He says, I'm going to tell my, my mom. He's an adult, but he says, I'm going to tell my mom what just happened. He wanted to tell his mom, you know, hey, mom, something's happened to me. On the road of life, they ran into some wide awake believers that understood what they're called to and held forth the gospel. And I just want to go to Colossians chapter 4 quickly because now that we know we're, we are, but God, um, who's rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, we who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Colossians 4 says, devote yourselves to prayer. Verse 2, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. So we stay prayed up. My wife and I came and prayed quite a bit yesterday, and um, I'm seeing the results. I'm praying, and I'm walking out the results. Praying at the same time for us as well, Paul said, that God will open up to us a door for the word. There are people like you and me out there, only on the other side of this, that need a credible voice in their lives. They need to have an encounter with a wide-awake, genuine believer. They need to understand how good God is, and they need to be introduced to him. Jesus being the one that broke the, the barrier and tore away the veil and all that obscured and disconnected us from God, and he's throwing us a beautiful lifeline. He's throwing such a lifeline. His uh, Church theologians call this the dispensation of grace or the church age, the uh, uh, and, and, and so this is an amazing moment we're in. And then it says in Colossians 4, 3, it says, praying at the same time for us as well, that God would open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned. He says that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Uh, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders making the most of the opportunity. Uh, Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with what? With salt, so that you may know how you should respond to each person. Paul said, uh, I became all things to all men that I might save some. To the uh, he said to those in the law, I was, I was, I have related to them in the law, yet I wasn't under the law. He said to the, to the Greeks, I, I, I related to them. He says, I'm a debtor to the barbarian and the Scythian, to the slave and to the free. Paul realized, like Jesus displayed, he cared about people of all socioeconomic levels. He spoke to the Samaritan woman uh, of another ethnicity. Uh, he spoke to. Uh, he, being a male, spoke to her. A female broke through the, the gender issues. He, he spoke, the, little, the parents would bring the children for him to bless them. He, he, the kids understood the, the, the sophisticates. He spoke to the scribes and the Pharisees, and it made the townsfolks mad. Then he spoke to the, to the, this, the, the, uh, this, this tax gatherers and the sinners, and it made the scribes and the Pharisees mad. Jesus was an equal opportunity offender when it came to loving everybody. The lady came in and broke a, a, a valuable bottle of precious spikenard ointment, which cost about 11 months' pay. It was like an extravagant. She broke it and poured it on him and anointed him. And uh, they got, particularly Judas Iscariot, got all upset about it, that it was wasteful and could have used it for the poor. He said, no, she did a good thing. It filled the whole room with the fragrance of a sacrifice and of a gift. And, you know, anointing Jesus with the, and then another anointed with, the, with their tears. Uh, there's just something profound about a life. I'd rather live a life focused on Jesus than a life ignoring Jesus. Since Jesus is the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. 
I'd rather live a life of, of adamant commitment to Jesus rather than speculation and constant cynical uh, dismissiveness. Uh, well, we're free thinkers. We should keep an open mind. Yes, but it's a narrow path, uh, and, and there's a broad path to destruction. So at some point, we've got to just dial in and say, this is, this is what I believe. This is who I believe. And the beauty of Declan and his fiance is they both are centered on Jesus. They have intellectual aptitude. They have likes and interests. They're, you know, they have romantic attraction to each other. All those things are really count. But boy, there's nothing better than having that Bible-based love for Jesus at the foundation. That's where we started. That's what's happening with Chelsea, Brian. That's what's happening with my brother Trey, who just asked Marcia to marry him. And then she said yes. That's what's happening with Jerry Owens and, and, and with Micah. Declan and Grace, yeah. I mean, Grace, he, he's, he's, Declan's getting graced out. He's marrying Grace. And uh, that's, how, that's how Maddie and King found each other. That's how, that's how uh, Dave and Angie found each other. And um, interesting things. Inter interesting things transpire as we rally around Jesus. You know, we have a pastor in Kosovo, Dritan, and he was visiting in Albania at a church, and he went up to the communion table, and in their, I guess in their approach, they, they go to the altar and go to the table, and they receive communion there. And he looked over, and he saw this vision of loveliness named Ina, and he met her at the communion table. That's romantic, man. When you're a Christian, that is hot. <laughs> that is hot. And um, this stuff I'm talking about is hot. This stuff I'm talking about, we're, this is real. It, it, Jesus makes all things new. He says, behold, will you not be aware of it? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, behold, all things have become new. And, you know, I love the idea of new wine and new wineskins. But I want to tell you, and I'm not a, I'm a teetotaler, and so this isn't something that's intriguing to me about the whole vintage wine culture, but I'm told that the, the stuff that people buy is the old stuff. So, you know, when you hear people get dismissive about the old and, and, so, and get, becoming trendy, I remember a young man that was, uh, had a platform for a while, and he came on the scene really big time, and he got up and he announced, get out of the way, the, gen the Joshua generation is here. And what he was basically saying was all the elders, get out of the way. The, the, this is, you know, it's, it's, it's a, and I didn't, I didn't, you know, I'm about that same age and I didn't feel, feel it was right. But I heard a very elegant elder pastor say, well, I, I get it that you're enthusiastic young people, but, but let me say something to you. The Joshua generation, actually, Joshua and Caleb didn't enter into the promised land until they were in their late 70s, and, 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 and uh, Caleb didn't get the, the mountain until he was on his 80th birthday. And, and so he says, Don't, God's just not done with us yet. By the way, the Joshua generation is not an age group like uh, the Generation Z or X or Millennials or, or uh, uh, Boomers. It, it, here's what a generation is. A generation is not defined by what time you were born. It's everybody that's alive at the same time. That's a correct definition for a generation. We are a generation. And in the Bible, it says you're a chosen generation. So that, that's timeless. And, and, and I want to tell you as I finish, the, the God that does restoration and makes all things new, um, he has old things and elegant things and stable things for us. And he has spontaneous new things for us. And uh, we've got to understand the value of both. Dick Mills, in a commentary on Matthew 13, 52, it, he said this of, of the NIV version. It says, the owner of a house brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. New treasures as well as old. And uh, this is, he says, a balanced verse. It tells us that we do not have to choose between old and new. We can have both. In a world given to choosing up sides, it's good to know 
that we can reap the benefits of both sides. The kingdom of God is not an either or a proposition. It is both old and new at the same time. Old is a good word because it means time honored, time tested, time proven. In this setting, old doesn't denote that which is obsolete, archaic, or worn out. Rather, it suggests the paths that are well-trodden, truths that have stood the test of time, ways, customs, and traditions that are familiar and meaningful and dependable. In uh, Yellowstone, there's a geyser called Old Faithful because of its predictability. A dog lover calls his faithful pet Old Shep. A proud nation symbolically calls its flag Old Glory. The householder representing the Christian brings out of his pantry old basic reliable stables, staples for his menu. The, the Lord does the same for us. The blood of Jesus, the name of the Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit, the effectiveness of prayer, the preciousness of worship, the warmth of fellowship, the solid hard rock value of the scriptures. If, if fasting and prayer brought revival 150 years ago, they will do the same today. If songs of praise produce the presence of the Lord in the Welsh revival of 1904, they will do that for us today, inhabits the praises of his people. The message of this verse is, don't discard the old in order to be ready for the new. God's treasures are like new edifices laid on the old foundations. Did you hear that? We're 35 years in at St. Louis Family Church. We're a, we've been called a Bible church, and we are. We're a faith church, a hope church, and a love church because those are the three that abide. We're extraordinarily optimistic. We have been. 30 years ago, in just a few days, this building had 10 feet of water in it. But we were never victims because we had been taught that in all these things we're more than conquerors. We were taught that we had a purpose, and that was to be, love our neighbors. And in that case, it was to go and clean up the houses and the businesses and get people back on their feet as quickly as we could. And history bears it out that this was the most rapid improvement of any of the flood of that entire area. And it was attributed by Tom Shaw that it was because of the reaction and the behavior of the church that set the pace to get the cleanup going that where we then facilitated 8,000 volunteers, many from out of town, William and Mary College, a group of, uh, of EMT workers and, and firemen from Canada, I remember just amazing, uh, uh, and because we responded as a church, because we had a prophetic heads up, uh, we provided, God instructed us to, to do cleanup before it even happened. God told me to do cleanup before we even had the experience of the flood. God told Joseph to have a store up grain before there was even a famine and a drought. God will tell people what's a, up ahead we don't know the hour of the day when Jesus comes back, but we need to occupy till he comes and have this kind of attitude. And when I saw David get saved as a teenager, and then I saw his dad come to the Lord, and his dad's just so dear. And, 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 and then, of course, the devil will try to come and run you off of that previous conviction. And that's why we've got to just continue to, uh, you see, callous build off. you got to just, you got to file it off. you got to just, I mean... Uh, it, it, it's just important that we do it and, and that we keep our hearts tender and we keep our lamps trimmed and burning. We make sure there's oil in the, in the, in the, the, the lamp and, and oil in our crankcase. If you don't have oil in your crankcase, you get cranky. That's why I'm teaching the love walk on Friday nights because love is patient, love is kind, faith works through love. And the greatest of these is love. And God is love, and love is value, and this world needs love right now because lawlessness and wickedness has increased. Many people's love will grow cold. For it to be okay to shoplift up to $900 and to be told by the workers not to be allowed to even stop people is an alarming trend of lawlessness. It's different than it was just five years ago. And so we see that, and it doesn't have to be politicized. We don't have to... Uh, ignore it and we don't have to fixate on it. It is what it is. He says the wicked will act wickedly and none of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. And in the end times many will be purged, purified, and refined. 
And we're seeing that in the church because judgment starts in the house of God. We're seeing that in each of our lives as God's getting us ready. And I'll tell you, I sense that. I sense every day, every minute, and every hour of every day, I'm getting more and more prepared and more and more ready. I turned to my wife and said, God's positioning us. She said, what? I said, God's positioning us. She said, I know. And then I'm looking at our church, and I'm seeing what God is doing. I think this is exactly what the Lord had planned. 1994, I'm reading about Dick, from Dick Mills, who is a true friend to us, an elder, and I honor him. And he, Though he's, he's dead, he still speaks through this devotional. And it's just so timely that what God did in antiquity, he does again and again and again, right? And uh, this is why I love the organized, the, 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 the liturgical church and the denominational church. Did I say in this service that a woman was helping at a Presbyterian church and, uh, for their vacation Bible school? And she said, they love you. And I said, well, I love them. That's why they love you. I thought, well, bingo. You know, we do ourselves a favor and we generate love. I went over to Caldy and I was getting some coffee and I was talking to this guy on his, he was riding a, a bike with all the bike gear and he recognized me and he gave me his card and asked me to pray for him. He was graduating from Covenant Theological Seminary, which made me know he was a Presbyterian Calvinist. And I said, um, he said, pray for me. I'm going to go start a church in a place in Iowa that has the lowest percentage of Christians. And he said, my friends at school are asking me, why are you going there? And, I said, and, he, said, and I, he and I both said, precisely for that reason, because it's an unchurched area. And he was like, and so I laid hands on him and I prayed for him. And then he, he was meeting with a number of these other guys, like five other Presbyterian pastors. And so they said, hey, you know, hey, it's good to meet you. Hey. And they said, we, we, we really like your TV spots. I said, well, thank you. I said, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to keep them gospel and not be new agey or self-help. And he goes, no, they're non-sectarian. They're, we get it. And, 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 uh, and I thought, we just had this little summit meeting at the coffee shop. And I thought, this is something God put in my heart when I didn't even understand why he was putting it in my heart. Because he wants to address the division. And he wants to bring unity and harmony. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love for one another. Right? Right? And this may not be that front burner important to you, but actually it is to Jesus. Because in John chapter 17, he said he prayed that we would be one. He said, even as we are one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit are really in three in one, very harmonizing. Right? And God wants the church. He said, behold how good and how precious it is when brethren dwell together in unity. So that's what God's doing post-COVID in the world we're in through all that darkness we came through. Gross darkness will cover the earth. But God will shine through you. God is enthralled with his people. God loves us with an everlasting love. He's drawn us with his loving kindness. Can I tell you? I'm an earthly father. I deeply love my four kids. I love the, the, the additional kids that have come in. And now we've got Brian. His mom's here today, Joni. And he's a beautiful guy. And Joni poured the gospel into him. And um, it, it, it's just clear to me that, that uh, you know, I have such a devotion to him. We love him. And now when we get grandkids, Angie's holding one of our little grandbabies over there that we share. And, uh, and, and, and there, we have five of them, one boy and four girls, and I'm just enthralled with them. They're, they're just so special to me. Well, I come to church here, and I really love you guys. And I love the idea of warm, real fellowship where we really love each other, and we've dropped our guards, and we're open, and we don't have hidden agendas, and we're trying real hard to hear from God and we're learning what pleases the Lord. Faith pleases God. Unity pleases God. Us not throwing away and discarding the ancient foundations. There are things Jeff Gould learned growing up in the, the, the deep fundamentals that he's carrying and he's imparting it into his kids. He comes in and he finds this, this spicy Mediterranean Italian girl and uh, it spices up the family. And uh, it's, it's the, Chris is the, the chili pepper of the household. And then it got on the kids. And, and they're just serious about God. That's a young man and that's a young girl that's just serious about God. And you get around them, 
They ask questions and they're thoughtful and they're prayerful. Of course, they've been through stuff and they're addressing temptation like everybody else. But let, let's just not let hardness come. Let's not let distance separate us from God. Let's not let bitterness and wrath and disputes uh, cause us to be crippled in our level of anointing. You know, Nathan and, and Tracy Fosnott are here, and Nathan and Tim were painting in the building, and, and, and we were having a staff meeting, and his mom works for us, and, uh, she, and, and I said, Nathan, and they were painting up on the wall up there to just spruce up the building, and I said, hey, can you guys paint the bathroom and the hospitality room? And he went, in Jesus' name, and... and uh, <laughs> And, and, you know, what could he say in front of the whole staff and his mom and everything? So I said, well, I know you're under pressure because your mom was there. He goes, no, I was calling out to Jesus because I know what my schedule's like, and I was believing God I could do it. <laughs> and, and he did it. He did it because there's power in the name of Jesus, right? We can raise our kids to, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Yeah. Declan and Grace could launch in their marriage serving God and making him the priority. We could deflect the spirit of the world and we could get serious about God because he says, I will make all things new. And out of the storehouse, he brings new treasures as well as old. Yeah. I value the foundations. I'm conservative in my theology in terms of the foundation of the Bible and the name of Jesus and the necessity to be born again and so forth. I'm adamant about those things. But I'm telling you, method-wise, I'm endeavoring to stay fresh and hear from God, but not in a novel, trendy a hip, hipster kind of a way. I'm trying to hear from God. And I'm excited that he is trying to talk to us. And he says, my sheep know my voice and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. And don't you love this verse that says, and I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you and I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. Let's all stand up on our feet. Hallelujah. We're going to finish with a song and I want to pray for you. How about this? How about if he makes all things new in your life? How many of you appreciate a new beginning? I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity for a fresh start. I love it in my marriage when we've had issues and we come together and apologize and we go through the forgiveness thing and work things through things. Isn't it nice where you're forgiven and you get a fresh start? Jesus does that. Jesus does that. On a day by day, minute by minute, hour by hour, he is constantly the, re the reconciler. He is constantly the redeemer. There's only one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. And he came to bring peace on earth, goodwill toward men. He's come to soften our stony hearts and give us a new heart. And, it, and if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. So when those guys got to lead these guys to the Lord out there in the, the highways and byways, the, the, the catalytic effect that it will have, the repercussive effect that it will have, the domino. Have you ever watch this? Go on the YouTube and look at people that set up dominoes for like three days. And, you know, I don't know where they even got all the dominoes. And then they push them and then they just all kinds of crazy. It's so cool. Or, or the ripple effect. Go to a pond and throw a rock in it. And just watch the ripples go all the way to the edge of the pond. One person's life in obedience can change a whole nation. One person's voice can cause a the gospel to go into a heart that was previously closed and cause conversion. You know, this, this Welsh revival, we went to Wales when we first got out of Bible school. And I preached in Wales in the Welsh towns amongst the Welsh people. They're beautiful. They're vocal. They're, they're, they specialize in amazing harmony, singing and things. It's an amazing culture. And in that 1904 revival in Wales, something happened where a uh, seed was sown and it, it germinated and grew and it caused amazing spreading of the gospel in these coal mining towns where hardened individuals got so changed that they had to change out the pack animals. They had donkeys and mules and horses that they used to haul the, the coal up out of the, the, the mines. And because the men had so changed, 
the horses didn't recognize them anymore because they were different than, so different from what they used to be. They weren't screaming. They weren't inhumane. They weren't beating them. They weren't swearing at them. They couldn't even understand them. They had to, go, they had to get the horse, new horses because the, 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 the mining guys became new creations. I remember when the Jesus movement hit in my context and I saw a number of us get saved. We were different from the day before. Out with the old, in with the new. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. So, you know, 50 years in, I look back and I don't look longingly at it. I don't look idealistically at it. David doesn't look idealistically at his 17th year. He's looking strategically at the impact and power the gospel had on him. And that's why he's standing with him, his wife on it, sharing it with his kids and you know, now Declan and Grace are taking it on. Kingston and Maddie are taking it on. You know, uh, Lucy and Nolan, the, the, you know, the God is, and, and I'm just thinking about, you know, what, what can happen to an individual that just bothers to care long enough and follows through on it willingly and what outcomes can take place through our obedience. I'm the product of Counter encountering somebody like you, not in a church service, not at an evangelistic meeting, hitchhiking home from my restaurant job on a one o'clock in the morning on a chilly November night in Southern California. And, and a Vietnam vet turned to me and said, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. And that pierced my heart. It addressed my, my uh, pseudo quasi uh, conclusion of pluralism and you know there are many paths to God and, and and just in a moment no Jesus is the exclusive only way he's the sacrifice and you must be born again boom and he wanted to pray with me I said no I'm, that's okay and I and he, I said you want to talk some more I said no he said okay and he let me go he trusted in the message enough I went home and I asked Jesus to come into my heart that guy's out there he still doesn't know that I got saved he still doesn't know that he was so so effective in taking me and addressing me and helping me to discover who Jesus is. So I just want to say to you, just sow the seeds. People know you're a Christian. Just live it. And then get some gospel tracks. We went to a, a shop the other day, and this lady had a rack up in her store, and she had gospel tracks in all these compartments, and they were free. And one of her colleagues said, she's had these in here for 30 years. When I saw that, I wanted to work for her. And the gospel, and she said, people aren't taking them as much as they used to. So I guess we need to take them and go give them, right? How many of you want to see more people come into the kingdom? Well, I do too. So God, help us. Help us as a, to be a soul-winning enterprise going forward. Close your eyes with me. Put your hand on your heart. And let's sing this song together. Before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. No matter where I go, no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. And as I bow before you, Father, I pray you make your face shine on each one of these folks. Pour out a blessing they cannot contain. Cause a joy to come where there was depression. Cause breakthrough to come where things have been stuck. Cause hope to come where things have been so harsh. Cause joy to come where things have been dreary and morbid. Cause us to experience a surge in our spirits from your Holy Spirit, God. By the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. amen. I want you to give a nice church hug to somebody on your way out. Stick around in fellowship. Prayer meeting at 630 tonight if you're interested. God bless you guys.
Hallelujah.